sure while the audience is eating. So uh, I think everybody's just about finishing up. But uh, enjoy your food. You're not going to offend me. Get more. There's a lot back there, I think. There are a lot of cookies I saved too for myself. Uh, this will be a little bit lighthearted, uh, easy, easy material. So uh, nothing complex for those of you that had the class I taught in the fall that was a little more in-depth, right? You listen to me drone on about anything you don't necessarily care about. All right, so a little bit about me. Uh, this is my about me slide without bullets. I try to be a little bit visual about it. I'm a YIT graduate three times over. I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end, but um, born and raised in this area. You see my family and my dog up there. I traveled a lot early in my career, um, working for Babcock and Wilcox, doing optimization and performance systems in the power industry. I went to, I think I was 37 of the 50 states in a period of about six years, so it was a lot of traveling. Um, have some interests up there, golf and home improvements, watch some sports. Worked in the steel industry, like I said, optimization and performance systems. I did R&D, formal R&D after I got my master's degree. Did some pretty cool uh, control uh, uh, algorithm development, uh, controls, um, some signal processing and signal analysis work with nonlinear dynamics and chaos theory. That was really highly mathematical stuff, which was a lot of fun take those algorithms and apply them into an industrial environment. Uh, built a lot of big systems, so the picture on the bottom left is me and a couple of folks. Uh, I was, that was actually a picture for, I think, the front page of the business section of the Beacon Journal, if I remember. And uh, my role was to stand in the point. Uh, had to look at the board, right? That was a big uh, multi-million dollar test system we had just built. Did some process improvement, business process improvement, so work in an organization that went around the company and just tried to teach people how to do things better. That was an interesting role in and of itself because I was in a position where I reported to an executive in the company, but I had nobody working for me, and my job was to go around and tell other executives how to do their jobs better. And I was like, well, you, know, you can't exactly just do that, so you gotta figure out how to influence people and kind of lead them along, right? I'll talk a little bit more about that a little bit. Uh, last year, I had the opportunity as I was doing some soul searching, you know, what do I wanna do? What do I wanna be when I grow up, right? I really liked my time in R&D, really liked technical management, I did that for a while. And the opportunity just wasn't coming together with the strategy that the company was in. I'll talk a little bit about strategy in a minute. Uh, so I had an opportunity to go to First Energy. I heard they were starting this new organization that was developing products and services for their customers, residential, commercial, industrial. And they had this new innovation and product development team that needed a manager. I said, that's exactly what I wanted to do. So I reached out to some contacts there, kind of researched the opportunity a little bit. I applied and ended up getting the position. I've been there uh, going on 10 months. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. It's kind of like a little mini startup within First Energy. Um, you know, trying to make products and services from the ground up. We'll elaborate a little bit more on that. So our portfolio, we say it's 85% core, 15% leaf. The way I describe that is the core is cool stuff. The leaf is the really cool stuff. So the, the core is, is, is the things that you would expect an electric utility like First Energy to be selling. So it could be things like uh, intelligent LED light bulbs, that might turn off and on when you're home or not home, or you can adjust the settings on them to uh, dim the room, or ones that have speakers built in that they can uh, play music while you're while you're actually go in front of that should I? While you're in the room, listen to music. Um, so th things like that, things that you would expect, home automation, right? The leaf stuff. We've got some cool products in our portfolio right now that span medical devices, uh, industrial safety equipment, and wearable technology, right? Those are things you would not expect in electric utilities. And quite frankly, we probably, most of those won't ever end up selling. We're gonna develop them, prove its concept, show that it works, demonstrate the technology, then try to sell it or license it to somebody else that maybe has a name in that space. Uh, but it's really cool work. It's, it's product de development from the ground up, it's invention, it's innovation, there's a lot of business-oriented work, especially in the field of contract negotiations, uh, with business model development, uh, things like that, relationship building. But that is enough about me. Uh, the reason I show you all that is to give me a little bit of credibility so that you'll listen to me for the next 20 minutes or so. Uh, hopefully I, I did that effectively. I don't really like talking about myself, but at the same time, I feel like uh, I, I'm here for you to listen. So uh, I want to throw it back to you all. So, so end of the program, right? You're all about to graduate. What is one of the most important things you learned in this program? Yeah. The design process. Design process? Great. What else? Team building. Team building, awesome. What else? Time management. Time management, excellent. Contact research. 
Got to do research. Absolutely. <laughs> Fabulous. Anybody else? Yeah. Des trying, designing a project under a budget. Designing a project under a budget. Awesome. Anybody else want to share? Those are all fabulous examples. Very, very good examples. Um, interesting comment thread to those. We'll talk about those in a minute here. So, so when I was in your shoes uh, about 12 years ago, um, and it was a little bit longer than that, but one of the professors said something that I, I, I took to heart, but I didn't realize it was as profound as it was when I heard it. It was actually Dr. M said it. I probably didn't remember saying it, but he said, uh, you know, getting your bachelor's degree doesn't necessarily teach you how to be an engineer. It doesn't teach you the skills to do the work you're doing. It teaches you how to think like an engineer, right? It teaches you how to think like an engineer. So again, that was kind of profound, and it's something that I've reflected on over the years. And yeah, you know, it's kind of the beginning, and, and I think uh, your associate dean this morning said something along the lines of you're just beginning your learning, right? Absolute truth to that. You're just at the beginning. You're going to learn so much more in your career uh, as you go on. So. Here's my presentation after all that leading. How to think like an engineer in 10 easy steps. By me, Eugene Hussain and Judge. So uh, it's going to be biased based on my experience. I probably left some things out because I've thought through this in all of the last four or five days. Um, but I think it's pretty well rounded. So maybe uh, when I write a book someday, maybe you all can say, hey, I was there when you presented this for the first time. <laughs> all right, so it's going to be like top 10 fashion, right? So we'll count our way from 10 down to number one. And uh, we'll see what you all think as we work through this, okay? All right, so number 10, start it off, write it down, because you're gonna forget eventually, right? Why do you write it down? Uh, a lot of people talked about code this morning. Some really cool projects, by the way. A lot of people talked about code. We comment our code, right? Why do we comment in our code? People know what we've done. So people know what we've done, exactly. I did a lot of software development when early in my career for a long time, and I learned very quickly, you know, people say, comment your code, comment your code. Like, okay, I'll comment my code, I'll comment my code. But then, I go back to something after six months of not looking at it, I'm like, what the hell was I doing here? I, I, don't, even, I don't even remember what I was thinking, right? And this, the, I'm, you know, when you write that code, you're so deep in it that you can just think it in and out, right? You're writing it. Uh, if it's not for that comment when I go back to it, it's, it's really hard to pick up on and keep moving, right? So it's like, oh, okay, I see what I was thinking now, right? Same principle. And, and, and same thing has happened to me throughout my career, right? I've worked on a lot of projects, simultaneously multiple projects at the same time. Now in management, my team is responsible for 20 projects at any given time. I need to know who they're talking to, what their major bottlenecks are, any milestones that are coming up, where they're having trouble, right? Across 20 projects so that I can help them, right? That's really, really hard to keep track of. And especially six months from now, a year from now, when I want to look back and say, what did we do on that project? Gosh, I don't remember. So I take a lot of notes. I don't necessarily take notes for now or for today. I take notes for later. So I try to think about me six months from now or a year from now reflecting back, knowing my frame of mind. And I do all the time reflect back to my notes and look at it and see, okay, that's what I was thinking. I got it now, I remember. All right, number nine, solve problems. This is a biggie, right? I really had a hard time figuring out where to put this in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the top 10, but I thought it was kind of foundational, so I thought putting it in nine makes sense, right? To solve problems, oh, by the way, be sure they're actually problems, right? So it's kind of the role of the engineer. I've got a three-year-old, almost three-year-old son, right? This is kind of my three-year-old way of explaining what an engineer does, right? We build stuff and we solve problems, right? Build stuff and we solve problems. But uh, the key to this, again, is make sure they're really problems. I've seen a lot of times where you get a bunch of people together, especially us engineers, and we'll get really excited about a given problem, fixing that problem, figuring out the best way to do it, right? We'll run down a path and develop it and spend a ton of money. We'll get some customer feedback and we take it to market, and nobody's really buying it. It's like, well, wait a minute, what happened? This is a great thing. Why is nobody buying my great thing? And, and maybe they're not buying it because maybe it's a little bit too expensive. Maybe it's not actually a problem that, the, that they wanted you to solve, right? Um, or maybe, maybe uh, the value proposition or the cost benefit of your device just really isn't worth it for them in some way, shape, or form, right? So, so this kind of grounds me in, yeah, great problem, great solution. I developed the best thing since sliced bread and it solves the customer's problem, right? So I heard, I think at least one of the teams mentioned voice the customer, right? Talking to the customer and getting critical quality CPQs uh, earlier, that's awesome. That's exactly what you want to do, right? Those are the tools that you use to figure out what the customer's needs are. Thank you, thank you. I did just say 10 minutes, didn't I? Thanks. Um, and uh, this is a good time check, right? If it comes up again after 10 minutes, I'll see. Uh, 
Make sure they're actually customer parabolas, right? Makes sense. All right, so the corollary to that, corollary 9.1, is you don't have to know the answer, but you should know how to get the answer using an objective scientific approach, right? What does that mean? Uh, I had, uh, in, in one of my, actually, my performance appraisals uh, years ago when I was working in R&D, my manager at the time said, you know, Jim, I, I know that when I, when I challenge you with something, even though you may not know it right away, you're going to go away, and you're going to come back, and you're going to have an answer. I think that's a huge compliment, right? And, and this, this translates to something that you probably all know inherently from going through engineering school, right? There's no possible way that you're going to memorize all the material in every single book that you ever looked at in your four plus years here, right? Impossible, right? If you take the core fundamental concepts, right? Know the basics of it. Maybe you go into a little more depth in some particular areas that you're going to work in on a day to day basis. You know how to find the answer, know how to solve the problems. Go find the answer and figure it out in a scientific, objective way. All right, number eight, pay attention to the big picture. So this is all about strategy. It does impact you, right? You may not realize. Um, I, I've worked for big companies most of my career, and big companies are always changing and doing things and pivoting themselves to kind of stay competitive in the constantly changing landscape, especially in the power industry in the United States where I spent most of my career, right? And you all know from seeing headlines around, you know, coal going away, natural gas is ridiculously cheap. Those market dynamics have changed the, the industry quite a bit, right? That, that impacts companies, and companies navigate through that in, in, in different ways. You'll see things like press releases, quarterly financial statements, 10Ks, annual reports, and all those things speak at a very high level, a very strategic level, um, but you know what I do is I always look at those and think about what does this mean to me, right? What does this mean for my job? What does it mean for what I'm doing? How can I affect that overall strategy? Come on in, guys, come on, sit down, sit down. How does it affect that overall strategy and where I'm going from here, right? And, and, and some of the biggest things, some of the biggest successes that I've had in my career have been a result of paying attention to that strategy and how do I help support that overall strategy, right? Let's talk a little bit more about that. All right, number seven, follow the process. And as I say, if it's not working, change the process. So process is important. Uh, I'm big in Six Sigma, big in design for Six Sigma. Um, done it for a long time. Like I said, I was in a process improvement team uh, for a while. We were making things better. It's all about efficiency. It's all about repeatability. It's all about quality, right? You need those things. Even in R&D, even in product development, you have some kind of process that you're following, right? It's a delicate balance between letting people be free-spirited and creative, but also following the process and following the rules, right? Um, I had a, and you, you all will appreciate this, we had an engineer, um, he had a PhD in very complex area of chemical engineering, right? No electrical background whatsoever. And he was himself trying to wire up a 120 volt, uh, I think it was about a 60 amp uh, uh, device or system at his desk, not in the lab, right? And, and I had the wonderful job of telling him, hey, you can't do that, right? And the response I got from his manager was, you're, you're stifling his creativity. And I said, no, he can be as creative as he wants. We've got electricians, we've got technicians, we've got people who have expertise in this particular field that can help them do it safely, right? So it's, it's always gonna be a delicate balance, especially in R&D, especially in product development where people need to be creative. But I, trust me, if we can do it in those environments, you can follow the process anyway. The key to that is continuous improvement, right? Which is corollary 7.1. Always think about ways to improve the process. Like I said, if it's not working, okay, let's fix it. Let's change it, right? It's our roles as engineers to make those processes better, right? We can't just go outside of it and do what we want and then not document it, not write it down, right? So you've got to follow that process, follow those guardrails. If the guardrails aren't working for what you're trying to do, make a new road, make new guardrails. Always be improving. Fair? All right, number six, embrace change. So th this, is a, this is a fun one for me. Um, I tend to like change, right? A lot of people, human nature resists change. And especially today, in, in our business environment, in our world economy, uh, in engineering, in electrical engineering specifically, things change on a rapid basis, right? And if you ever find yourself going, yeah, but we used to do it this way, that's probably not a good spot to be in, in general. Um, embrace change, right? Embrace new things. Uh, you'll find that challenges and new things help you grow, help you learn. Uh, again, I'll talk a little bit about the strategy, right? Some of the biggest, uh, you know, 
improvements or promotions in my career that have resulted from embracing change, right? A company has a new strategy, a new vision, changing things up, and I embrace it, right? Okay, I can help impact that strategy, I can help impact that vision. Okay, let's make you the manager of such and such, right? It, it's, it's, it's that attitude, it's, it's not just saying it, right? You gotta deliver on it, right? So don't hear me just say, yeah, I'm all about change, and then just not do anything, right? You gotta actually deliver on that, right? Deliver on those promises, but, but don't see change as a bad thing, see change as an opportunity. And then related to that, don't be afraid to jump, right? I think uh, the statistic now is 35% of people in the workforce in the US have changed their jobs in the last three years. And on average, a typical worker in the US spends 4.2 years in their jobs, right? So that all translates to people move around a lot, right? And again, going back to embracing change, Look at, look at opportunities, right? Don't be afraid to take new opportunities. It doesn't even have to be leaving whatever company or organization <coughs> or, or university that you're working at or researching at. Uh, think about new areas of research. Think about new departments. These are all opportunities to grow. These are all opportunities to learn. They're all opportunities to continue your own development, right? And keep it exciting, right? Um, I find that I, I'll get bored after a little while and, uh, and I need to find whatever that next thing is. I think that's part of why product development, R&D, work well for me because I'm always doing something new, right? I'm not doing the same thing over and over again. I'm always doing something new. After six months, it's some other new thing, right? So I'm always on that leading edge. It keeps it interesting for me. Um, and, that, and that's part of that. Don't be afraid to jump. All right, number four, know the numbers. We're all engineers, right? Numbers are very important, right? Lots and lots of numbers that we deal with, uh, whether they're in electrical engineering, whether they're in physics, whether they're in fundamental sciences. Uh, there's also a whole other set of numbers, business numbers, right? Um, that companies operate by. One thing that I've learned, because I didn't have uh, strong business fundamentals coming out of school, right, but I've developed them over time, and I subsequently went back for an MBA, um, was that a lot of decisions in big companies, regardless of their technical merits, are made based on cost analysis, right, cost-benefit analysis, right? So there's, there's um, you know, techniques for that, uh, net present value, internal rate of return, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you can actually put things on a spreadsheet explain in dollars and cents which of these options is better, right? Uh, and it's, it's really encouraging to me to see you all present your projects and talk about managing your projects and managing your budget because that's really how it works in the real world. To be given a budget, you're gonna have to manage to that budget. If you have the best idea in the world, but you can't quantify that to the person that's controlling the dollars, it, it's not gonna get very far, right? Even if you're in your own startup, right? You still gotta get those, those, uh, you know, those venture capitalists to invest in you, right? And there's a lot of other startups out there, right? So know the numbers, not just the technical ones, but also the business numbers. All right, number three, understand the details. So details are important. Uh, details have been important to me. I've always been a detail-oriented person, and, and I feel like that's helped me out a lot. Um, it sets you apart from a lot of other people, because believe it or not, most people don't pay attention to details. It blows my mind. But uh, Dr. Monroe, if you don't mind, I'm gonna throw you uh, uh, throwing, not necessarily throwing you under the bus, but I'm gonna mention you a little bit, right? Dr. Monroe is very particular about how he likes staples on papers, right? You've all seen that, right? There's a reason he does that, right? It's being detail-oriented, right? Understand the details, right? It, it programs you to think about the details, right? It's not so much about the staple, maybe it is not the staple, but it's not so much about the staple, right? I don't think it is, at least. It's about the details, right? If you have a complex analysis, right, and now all of a sudden you've got a rounding error halfway through it, or you've got a spelling error through a big executive presentation, right? That just damages your credibility, right? If you're presenting to a leadership team and you, you've got this wonderful report, and all of a sudden you've got the name of the company that you're talking about spelled wrong, which actually this happened for my team in the last two months, right? That's not good, right? That's not good, you can't do that, right? You're gonna hand that over to the leadership team, they're going, these guys don't even know how to spell our name, right? Typo, it's a typing error, but it's details. You gotta pay attention, right? All right, corollary 3.1. Engineers instinctively pay attention to detail. So I'm gonna say we are wired this way more than most, right? We are wired this way more than most. Uh, embrace that instinct. But also, so here's the counterpoint, knowing good enough is good enough. So one thing that I've seen in working in companies full of engineers is that if we get sucked into those details, so now I'm gonna contradict myself a little bit, it's intentional is that uh, you'll constantly iterate on something, right? Trying to find that best solution, right? Where I'm, I'm trying to solve a problem to 37 decimal points of accuracy, right? Because damn it, I can do it, 
right? I can get that 37 decimal points of accuracy. But you know what? Maybe 12 was good enough, right? 12 is all the accuracy you need because the microprocessor you're trying to load the program on can't go past that or something along those lines. Or maybe the tolerance of the thing you're trying to build can only go to eighth of an inch. So what's the point of going to 64th of an inch, right? Uh, so no one good enough is good enough, right? It, it plays into the attention to detail. You gotta have your details, but you also have to have the appropriate precision for, for where you're working. All right, number two, so we're getting towards the end here. Ask questions. This is as basic as it is up there. Ask questions. Sometimes you ask questions to inform yourself. Sometimes you ask questions to learn from somebody else, their experiences, right? It's insanely valuable. Especially if you're working with, early in your career, people that are more experienced in your field. Ask them a lot of questions. Why did you do that? Why did you make that decision? What would cause you to go that way, right? It helps inform you, again, that growth, that development, that learning, right? Um, but also, it's a great technique for leading people, too, right? So, so I've learned over time that Better to have somebody get to an answer on their own than to tell them, right? And this especially plays true in working with teams and, and management, right? Um, sometimes that adversarial thing helps you grow, but sometimes people don't react so well to that, right? Uh, and it's, it's to show them the why, right? So if you can ask a series of questions to help that person develop their own understanding, now you're mentoring them. Now you're showing them how you know inherently what it is that you know, right? And you're developing that answer. And now it's more likely to stick. Right? They're actually more likely to remember it. They're more likely to remember it. Right. All right, number one, most important, and I've already referenced it probably at least five times, right? Keep learning. This is just the beginning. This is the start of your career. This is the start of your learning. It's a huge milestone. You've all worked really, really hard to get here. Whether you're going into industry, whether you're going into academia, you want to keep learning. Um, hands up if you think electrical engineering is a field in which things do not change and are always the same, even 10 years down the road. Exactly. It's going to change. Things are going to change. So at a minimum, just to stay current, you have to keep learning, right? Uh, it amazes me in the 12 years since I graduated with my bachelor's degree how much things have changed, right? The things that we did when we were doing our robot for our capstone project are just rudimentary things that you all can do without even really thinking about, right? It was the heart of our pro project, right? It was so complex to get this autonomous algorithm into this microprocessor that we spent most of our time focusing on that. And, and, and the chipsets available now, the technology available now that you guys get to leverage in the projects that you're doing, that's an afterthought, right? You're now at a point where you're taking that to the next level, right? And it's going to continue to do that, especially in this field. So I, I wanted to sum it up a little bit. And this is uh, for my team at, at First Energy. I uh, don't necessarily have these 10 principles, but we, what we have are guiding principles, right? Uh, my team is not all engineers. In fact, not a single person that works for me is an engineer. Um, but we have what we call hashtag corner. And it's something that's evolved over time, right? But you'll see at the heart of hashtag corner is kind of these 10 principles that we just walked through, right? Uh, it's all about details. It's all, all about taking on challenges, embracing change. It's all about, you know, owning it, right? Write it down, follow the process. Those are straight one to one. So, I'll that um, so the last thing I have is, is a bonus one for you, okay? We'll end it on, on this note, right? So we talked about how to think like an engineer, right? I feel like I've had a pretty good career so far. I got, I got a ways to go until I retire. I never think about retiring. But I've had a good career so far. I worked really, really hard to get where I am. But I always, always, always put my family first. My family is very, very important to me. And one thing to always remember is nobody else is going to put your family first for you, right? Uh, I, can, I can even describe one occasion. I went on a vacation. My son at the time, uh, this was two years ago, he had just turned one. And we took him to the first beach vacation. And there was some significant stuff going on at work. I spent an entire day email and phone, right? No family time, no vacation time. My wife wasn't too happy with me, um, so that sucks, right? And, and number two, I missed a lot of quality time with my son, right? He's never gonna be one year old again, right? So I look back on that vacation, that's my reminder to you, right? My job is important, I bust my butt for my job, I work really, really hard for my job, but my family is also very important, okay? And nobody else is gonna put your family, your friends, whatever is important to you, Nobody's gonna put that first but you, so always remember that. Use that counterbalance, right? Success is a wonderful thing. It's good to have a rewarding career, but remember the things outside of the job. Right? That's all that I have. Anybody have any questions?